going to be the chair. I'm going to be the chair um, of this panel. Uh, Rob, please correct me if I'm wrong. The expectation is that 10 to 12 minutes for the talk and three to five minutes for the Q&A after the talk, right? And then with the panelists, my understanding is that Rafal is going to start and I'm going to go. And then for the, for the third presenter, it's going to be Aaron. Is that okay? Is that right? And then the fourth presenter is going to be Vahid. Okay, just wanted to confirm to make sure that I'm, I'm calling the right people here. Okay, so I think we're going to be ready to start. Thank you so much for everybody who stuck around. You guys are fairly pers persistent in Europe, where I am now is 8.15 in the evening. So I admire your persistence. Um, so take it away, Rafal. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Rafał Olszowski, and I'm a social scientist uh, working as a researcher at the AGH University of Science and Technology in Kraków. Uh, I'm also a research affiliate at the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. And the topic of our today's meeting is studying online collective intelligence in policy making. So, um, all right, uh, briefly, what I will present. Uh, I will uh, talk about 15 existing methods of studying CI in open policy making that we have identified in our research and uh, preparation of evaluation framework that we have used for case study and uh, analysis of group cognition processes in a selected case that was citizens budget of the city of Krakow. So uh, from the very beginning, the studies on online collective intelligence referred to a kind of collective mind and used to describe it in terms derived from cognitive psychology and uh, analysis of group cognition processes in, in, on the internet uh, or, uh, was proposed just when the studies on online CI started, so in the mid 90s. And it was proposed by Pierre Levy, David Engelbert and, and many others. As uh, we have learned from many presentations at this conference, the factors that influence the emergence of CI include self-organization, decentralization, equal participation, cognitive diversity, or swarm behavior. So it is hard to imagine anything more distant from this concept than policymaking as understood in the old way, uh, as a domain based on hierarchical and rigid institutions open uh, only to few people, very formalized. But the domain of policymaking that used to be uh, strictly limited to small groups of specialists is now increasingly opening for the participation of wide collectives, which are influencing government decision, uh, citizen engagement, transparency, uh, they are improving service delivery and, and many others. Uh, so the concepts like deliberative democracy and collaborative governance and the global projects like open government partnership are now in the center of interest of policymakers. The national and local governments launch plenty of projects on legislative reforms, urban planning, forecasting, and online consultations. While collective intelligence has become a more common approach to policymaking, the studies on this topic are, are not conducted in a systematic way. Methods of studying vary greatly depending on discipline in which they are conducted. As uh, my literature review proved in recent years, uh, several methods and strategies have been proposed for these studies, but most of them treat this topic only in one dimensional way. Uh, they analyze a limited number of processes related to CI and none of them, I mean none in the field of CI and policymaking, took the collective cognition as the basis of analysis. So the first stage of my research was a systematic review uh, of the literature. My aim was to find out what kind of methods have been used so far. The Web of Science was chosen as the source database. The time frame uh, was set for the period from 2010 to 2019. When selecting keywords, I used the term collective intelligence, but also alternative terms like uh, crowdsourcing, uh, wisdom of crowds, swarm intelligence, crowd law. And the second set of keywords included terms related to policymaking domain like public policy, political science, public administration, public governments, and, and, uh, and uh, others. And this research has led to uh, initial number of 170 references. Then I'd made uh, exclusion of conference proceedings and reviews and irrelevant uh, categories. So the refined list contains 75 results. 
As expected, the fields of research in the literature uh, varied greatly. The study topic being conceptualized differently. And uh, here you can see a summary of the most frequent web of science categories assigned um, to the examine texts. Um, and more interesting is when I, uh, I will show you the grouped uh, disciplines. So the first group is computer science and related. Second one is political science and related and others that are less, uh, less frequent. And you can see that there is um, in the first years, uh, the group one and group two are, are nearly similar. But in 2017, we can see an increase, increase of the tech as a whole and increase, especially in the political science and related in this studied field. So this is a, a change that, that has occurred. And uh, here, uh, uh, the content of articles uh, that was evaluated by our team uh, with uh, expert boasts in both policymaking and information technologies and uh, as a result of analysis, 15 methods of studying CI in policymaking were identified. Each of the texts was assigned a minimum of one and maximum of four methods and strategies. So here you can see the list uh, from the most to the least frequent methods. As you can see, two approaches are dominant. An analysis of organizational structure or design and an analysis of the created values. And uh, here you can see the definitions that we have adopted to describe particular methods or strategies. Uh, we used a uh, grant, granted theory method for extracting the values, grouping, presenting the key concepts, distilling from them the categories. Uh, so we can see that the analysis of the organization structure dominates and there are the studies conducted from organizational perspective. Uh, it is an approach to describe CI projects as systems with rules, resources, technologies, stakeholders, et cetera. And then the created values, another uh, popular category, the values that arise in the project, for example, epistemic, democratic, or economic values. Uh, you can see also the other popular methods uh, like participants' behavior, collaboration model, communication, innovation process, uh, and decision making, and others. And uh, for surprise, analysis of AI algorithms was not uh, very popular in this, in this field. So this, this surprised us. Uh, here you can also see the tech cloud. This first one is based on abstract of articles, second on article titles, and, and the third one on original keywords. So we can see that the words crowdsourcing uh, is, is uh, dominating, but also the word public, um, and uh, especially uh, in the titles, there is also participation, social management, and, and others. Uh, so what are conclusions of this review? First, the study of CI in policymaking is almost completely separate from the study of AI. Then the category impact on policymaking is also insignificant, which is, which is not so good, I think. Uh, systemic approach is dominant. And it makes us realize that there is still a niche for more humanistic or, for example, anthropological research in the field. Uh, there is a clear trend of interest in CI in the cities and local governance. It's over 25% of articles. And uh, finally, no particular method based on analysis of group cognition processes, which we were interested a little. Uh, so, because this review proved that no methods of uh, analysis of cognition processes was present in, in uh, study CI in policymaking, we uh, decided to prepare a new evaluation technique. And for this purpose, uh, we choose as leading theory the multiple interacting levels of cognitive systems perspective proposed by Goldstone and Tyner. And based on this knowledge, we focus on four main cognitive processes, perception or collective sensing, problem solving, decision making and collective memory, including learning and gaining feedback. The preliminary framework was also further developed by with the use of granted to your method and uh, with participation of experts and participants in the selected uh, case study. A uh, participatory budgeting project uh, called uh, Civic Budget of the City of Krakow was selected for a case study, and the evaluation questions were also developed for each examine process. So you can, you can see the slides from this, this project, and here you can 
see the evaluation questions that that we uh, prepared. All right, so uh, this was a qualitative study, of course, based on in-depth interviews. And this study has led to some uh, interesting results. So first, it turned out that the most of the processes are working well, with no one notable exception, the process of collective memory, which works only to a very limited extent. Basically, all the respondents claim that memory-related operations uh, are the most important problem, and the projects repeat uh, uh, similar errors in the following ratios, and new participants seldom use past experiences. After participating once, they do not remain a, remain a part of this system for the next years, because the project is, is running in years, uh, year, yearly iterations. Uh, also, learning mechanisms do not work well in practice. A cognitive system uh, is, uh, has difficulty to deliver intelligent results, because as the theory says, cognitive theory says, uh, all thinking operations, both individual and collective, uh, depend on memory. Uh, so the memory should allow us to manage the energy of the entire system, not to waste energy analyzing the same activities over and over again. Thanks to this observation, I think we can focus on the improvement of quality of the future projects. Um, if the quality of collective memory is improved, the level of collective intelligence can increase significantly. So this is this is the conclusion which which I would like to present to you. And uh, yeah, so that's basically all. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, I'm here ready to answer. Thank you, Rafael. We're going to wait a few seconds uh, to see if there are any questions. Okay. If there are no more no questions, then we I think we should move along. And if you want to get in touch with Rafal, please do so. Um, so the next talk is going to be my talk. Let me first share the screen. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Rob, can you let me know if you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, we can hear it. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, my name is Aline Koman. Um, I'm an associate professor at Princeton University. My most, my more established work is on the formation of collective memories and on the synchronization of collective beliefs. In this project, I uh, this is my first foray into collective problem solving. And I just want to acknowledge my co-author here, Jake Gobel, was a research assistant in my lab at Princeton and um, uh, started grad school at Ohio State University. So let me go uh, um, straight to... Um, uh, uh, presenting to you a problem uh, that, con that is very representative of the types of problems that I'm gonna focus on in, in today's talk. Um, so the problem is as follows. Two Italians are sitting at a, at a table in a restaurant and are having a, a pizza. The older Italian is the brother of the younger Italian, but the younger Italian is not the brother of the older Italian. How could it be? I'm not gonna ask the audience, I, I, typically uh, um, don't like asking uh, the audience to solve these types of problems. Uh, but probably what's going on to your mind is you're, you're stumped. If you are like the 90% of participants uh, who are faced with this problem, they're stumped. They don't know how to answer uh, the question, the, the puzzle. These are called stumpers. They they're, were collected by Maya Bar Hillel at U Hebrew University. Now, the reason why people are stumped when they consider this particular uh, puzzle is because they represent two Italians sitting at a table at a table as two male uh, participants, but uh, as two males. But if you kind of uh, move away from this bias to represent two Italians sitting at a table as two males, you can we can easily solve the problem by figuring out that there's a brother and a sister sitting at a table, and that's how you can solve the problem. As I mentioned, this is a, a type of problem that's representative of uh, insight problems, which is what I'm going to focus on in today's talk. So insight problems are uh, involve prioritizing intuitive judgments over a more systematic approach. I don't have time to provide a theoretical scaffold for this type of problems and situating them uh, uh, alongside the analytic problem solving uh, uh, and the reasoning involved in analytic problem solving. But it, I think suffice it to say that 
uh, intuitive reasoning that is characteristics to inside problems is, an import, is important in a variety of contexts. So consider the Apollo 13 mission. Um, if anybody remembers the crisis that ensued uh, on Apollo 13, it had to do with carbon dioxide. dioxide it was uh, accumulating in the cabin. Uh, they uh, couldn't uh, get rid of it. They couldn't reduce it to a tolerable, tolerable le level. But in the end, they used intuitive reasoning to use some objects that they were that, that they had at the board of the spacecraft and they solved the problem using intuitive reasoning. This is a, a situation that had positive outcomes, but most of the times, in, or a lot of the times, intuitive reasoning does not have positive consequences necessarily. So consider what happened in the United States after the September 11 attacks. A lot of people hesitated to take, to go on um, air, airplane travel follow a few months following the attacks and they chose to uh, use their cars, which resulted in a lot of uh, car accidents. And it, it's estimated that actually a lot more people died in car crashes as a consequence of trying to uh, uh, um, uh, not go on airplanes. So uh, these types of problems and the, and the resolution that comes with these types of problems has this interesting characteristics. On the one hand, there's this biases that are operating when people are making the decisions to either fly or uh, um, take a car. And, and the other dimension that's interesting to these types of problems is this amplification of bias. The notion is that people socially construct these dread risks, as uh, Gerd Gigerenzer puts them. Uh, so, so these are the two characteristics that I want to focus on uh, in the talk. And I'm proposing the incremental insight model uh, to describe the process through which people alter the degree of bias that operates during reasoning. Uh, this model has two main assumptions. The first assumption is that intuition biases circumscribe the representation of the problem space. So go back to the two Italian problems I presented to you before. The notion is that people have certain biases to represent the problem space in a particular way, and those biases pull them away from solving the problem correctly. Um, there's uh, um, uh, the other assumption that goes into this model um, is that if we expose participants to bias inconsistent inferences, that should help in overcoming their biases and representing the problem space. So this is a graphic representation of the incremental insight model. On the y-axis, you have the probability of reaching a solution. On the x-axis, you have the activation of bias inconsistent cues. Um, so the notion is that the more bias inconsistent cues are active in your consciousness, the likelier you are to reach that zone of insight, which is going to help you solve the problem. So going back to the two Italian problem, if you present people with some sort of an image uh, uh, such as this, then they might um, uh, consider uh, the, the thing that they're missing, or they might reduce the, their bias in uh, solving the problem. Okay, so for research goals today, I have two main goals. Goal number one is to provide validation to the incremental insight model. It could be that people do not reason like that, that they do not follow this incremental insight model. So we just want to empirically test that. And for goal number two, uh, I want to create the conditions to overcome these reasoning biases in network communities. As you might imagine, these biases could get amplified in network communities. And I want to understand that process by which it gets amplified or attenuated. So. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two studies, uh, two empirical studies. I'm an experimental psychologist, so for us, we have the luxury to take things into the lab and to manipulate uh, variables and control variables and see what happens. So that's what we did in study, study one. We manipulated insight. The way we did that is we used another stumper developed by Maya Barhilel at Hebrew University, as I said before, it, and it, it, it looks as follows. A big brown cow is lying down in the middle of the road. The truck is driving towards the cow at full speed. Its headlights are off. Yet the driver sees the cow from afar easily and avoids hitting it without even having to brake hard. How is that possible? Now, if you're trying to solve the puzzle, what, what probably happened is this reference to headlights being off created in your mind a mindset of, of, of a night frame. This notion that it's night, it's like, you know, what, what, what's happening here? How was, was the driver able to avoid the cow uh, even though the headlights were off? But we didn't make any reference to the fact that it was day, day or night. Um, so what we did is we expanded the stumper, we created a story out of it, and we inserted as part of the story five critical elements. So there was a large building, there was a fluttering insect, fluttering insect was a beverage on a table uh, in a building, there was a delivery that was made to an apartment, and there was 
the bird that was making its characteristic call. Now, what's special about these critical items is that they were non-specific. We didn't mention what is the building or what is the insect, but we were thinking if participants are in a certain mindset, are either a night mindset or a day mindset, they, if we ask them to make inferences about what these items are, they're gonna reveal what type of mindset they, they're in. So for the building, they might say it was a postal office. And we know if it's a not postal office, that probably then they have activated in their mind a day frame. Whereas if they said it was a bar, then probably what they have activated in their mind is a night frame. So that's, this is what we did. This is the procedure. Participants read the brown cow stumper individually. Uh, half of the participants uh, uh, read a day frame, the other half a night frame. They read the exact same story, the same stumper, but there was one sentence difference. In the day frame, we activated a day frame mindset. In a night frame, we activated a night frame mindset. Uh, only one sentence difference to create those, those different mindsets. Um, in the next phase, we asked them to make inferences as part of dyadic conversations. So participants had conversations with one another, and they just had to make inferences about the five critical items that we had in there. Um, we had uh, three types of pairings. Uh, there was day-day uh, pairing, so participants who had day frame uh, paired with a participant, when not participant who had a day frame, mixed pairs, and part both participants had a night frame. After they had these conversations for five minutes, uh, we asked them to individually propose a solution to solve the stumper. Um, so here are the results. Let's look at the inferences. On the y-axis, the proportion of night inferences that they made. And on the x-axis, the, the type of critical items, the, the, the different critical items that they made inferences about. As you can see in dark, in the night frame condition, participants made uh, many more night inferences than in the day frame condition for each of the five critical items. Um, and the solution uh, uh, followed that type of inferencing. In the night-night condition, so when the pair was, was made out of two participants who had a night frame, they were much less, less likely to solve the stumper than in the day-day condition, with the mixed conditions being closer to the day-day condition. More interestingly for what we're studying here, this notion of incremental insight, um, um, what we did is we compared our model prediction. So we said that the more activated this um, bias inconsistencies are, the more likely people are to solve the puzzle. So here in the observed results, what you see is a proportion of uh, participants who reached the correct solution as a function of the number of inferences that they were provided with by their conversational partner. So these are night, night frame participants who are, who are paired with uh, different people, and those different people either give them one, zero to one uh, daytime inferences, two to three daytime inferences, or four to five daytime inferences. What you see is that a night frame participant who's presented with four or five day inferences is 100% likely to uh, solve the puzzle correctly. In study two, we wanted to observe this incremental insight in conversational networks. So what we did is, again, we had participants uh, 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 read the brown cow stumper, um, day frame participants, night frame participants, and then they are, were asked to make inferences, but now in a conversational network structure. So what you see here is 10 participants that were part of a network. They had sequential conversational interactions. What you see here represented are the nodes being the participants and the links be between them being the conversations that they had with one another in which they were, they were giving each other the inferences that they came up with. The white nodes are participants with a day frame. So what they're provided with the, with the day frame, uh, the darker shade participants had the night frame. There's a difference between the very dark uh, shade participants. Those people had uh, only one conversation with a day participant and the uh, gray shade uh, had two conversations with a day frame participant. Um, in the end, after a few, after five minutes of conversations as part of these networks, uh, they were asked to provide uh, a solution. And here's what we find. Um, participants in the day frame solve the puzzle correctly almost 60% of the time. Night frame participants who had conversations with two day frame participants solve the problem almost the at the same rate. And the night frame participants only had one conversation with a day frame participant solved the problem only 44% of the time. Um, and then again, evidence for this incremental insight uh, model, the proportion of correct solution on the y-axis and the number of day inferences received from day frame participants that we can go from one to seven. You see that participants who received seven daytime inferences, they were able to solve the problem 100% of them were able to solve the problem correctly. So concluding remarks, 
I hope I was able to convince you that this is a, a, a credible initial foray into the psychological and structural features that could be deployed to diminish reasoning biases. Obviously, it needs more validation. We're planning on using other insight problems to, uh, to observe uh, uh, this dynamics. It needs more specificity. We're not sure whether there's a threshold at which people get it, uh, or whether that, it could be that that threshold is, is hidden by averaging across participants, but there could be individual differences in how people solve this problem. Uh, it also needs generalization. So we want to go from stumpers to more real world type of scenarios. Um, finally, I think what's in, important about this, this project is that we're proposing a framework to programmatically explore how, a, how one could diminish reasoning biases in network communities. And with uh, Hirokazu Shirada at Carnegie Mellon, we're, we're using artificial intelligence to identify and correct bias in network communities. Um, that's, that's everything I have. Thank you for your attention and let me know if you have questions. Uh, nice work, Alvin. It's Vahid here. Can you hear me well? Hi, Vahid. Yes. Yeah. So it was just, uh, very nice work. I was just wondering in case we ask them, I mean, we ask groups to come up with a group answer. So in your case, I think they have to come up at the end with individual answer. So like, uh, did you have any experiment on this? Or I was wondering whether they can come up with an answer faster mm -hmm. because of all the communication and coordination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have not. So I should say, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say this, but I should say that uh, we're still collecting data for the network studies. We only have 10 networks. We stop data collection. These are physical networks. So we get people in the lab to be present in the same room. Um, we stopped data collection because of the pandemic, so uh, more than a year ago. Um, uh, we're still collecting data, and we have other variables that we're looking at, but we do not have a variable by which we vary whether they make the decision collectively or individually. I think it would be interesting to have it and to see the differences between the individual versus collective. Um, um, so thank you for the question, but the answer is we, do, we don't have data. Just one short follow-up. I mean, uh, those that come up with individual answer, are there like significant uh, differences within their answers? I mean, as a group, they thought about something, but their answers are mostly similar or they come up with completely different answers? I mean, within that group, any? Uh, you mean the, the solution to the stumper or the, yeah, yeah. the inferences? I know the solution that they provide at the end. Yeah, the solution, it's coded by, uh, um, by, by somebody. And then, I, see, I don't know whether there's variation, but the research assistant said it's fairly straightforward to kind of code whether they give the correct answer or the incorrect answer. And I, I didn't mention this, but the, um, the, their inferences are actually coded by an independent group of participants who tell us what they think, whether the inference is a daytime inference or a nighttime difference. So that's, that's how it's coded. I forgot to say that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, are we over time? Aline, may I ask a quick question? Sure. Sure. I, are we over time, Rob? Do you, do you mind telling me? Uh, no, you still have two minutes. Okay, great. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the pre-networked area, uh, era, so like the 1970s, 1980s, people, of course, also faced with these brain stumpers, as you put it. Mm -hmm. And uh, some methodologies were developed. Uh, for example, the Kepner-Trego method. I don't know whether you've ever heard of it. So problem analysis, uh, problem structuring, and they were uh, exactly trying to get at these um, cognitive biases or, so we, uh, or assumptions that hold people back, uh, let them think in a certain path and uh, disallowing them to find a solution. Mm. So uh, this was not uh, collective. This was really trying to, um, uh, you might say, small group reasoning and trying to overcome these um, uh, these uh, assumption blocks. Maybe mm -hmm. worthwhile to so we really dig back into this. Ben Trego was one of the... Uh, uh, the individual B N so Ben and then T R E G O E. Excellent. Thank you so much. I don't know that literature. I'll I'll, I'll look back at it. I think it's important to to have that that background. Yeah, and he was a consultant. So uh, because at that time the consultants did a lot of uh, of work in that area. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Great. Thank you. So I think for in, in the interest of time, we should move on. If you guys have questions or suggestions, please uh, let me know in the chat.
I'll get back to me. Okay, so our next speaker is going to be Aaron. Thank you. All right, give me one second to share my screen. Sure. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that? That's good. Yes, Aaron, we see it. Uh, great. All right. So my name is Aaron Schechter. I am presenting our work, Emotions and Information Diffusion on Social Media. Uh, this is a project by one of our grad students, uh, P. Kumar Sachin, who couldn't present today, but I'll try my best to, to do it justice on behalf of the supervisors. Uh, so the basic motivation for this study is that we all can acknowledge that information diffusion is important. So how do things go viral? How do messages spread? And how do online platforms enable some of this sharing of information, the spread of content, um, and this open access to, to ideas? Um, so across many different domains, there's agreement that social media can drive consequences in the real world. It can drive collective action. This could be both positive or negative. Um, on the positive end, you can mark yourself safe in a disaster. You can fundraise a lot of money or you can organize social movements. On the negative side, of course, we all know about fake news, radicalization and polarization. So it's an important practical problem to understand how media gets disseminated, how messages can be more effective at traveling farther through a network. Uh, and there's basically two countervailing arguments as to what will happen when we have more emotionally charged or more sensitive content. Um, on one hand, there's the idea that people will share sensationalist messaging, right? They see things that are, you know, interesting or thought provoking and they want to share it. They get high arousal or excitement out of it. And this is arguably, you know, the dominant perspective in the literature, at least through the reviews we've done, most, most assumptions are that, oh, sensationalist items will be shared more. But there's the argument, and this largely comes from communication and more sociological literature, is that people will self-censor self -censor or suppress their emotional statements, um, either because they regret sharing too much or because they don't want to appear as someone that is overly emotional, or they don't want to divulge too much depending on the audience of their messaging. So there's this counter argument that very emotional content should not be shared, at least in interpersonal communication. So what we argue here is that there's a curvilinear relationship, in particular, an inverse U-shaped relationship. Uh, so let me just briefly go over what we mean by diffusion before I get into the specific hypotheses. Um, so in this paper, we actually look at three different measures of diffusion. So consider this as a diffusion cascade here, where each node is a user on a platform. Uh, gray nodes are users that have shared the same piece of content. And black nodes are those that receive it or observe it, but do not necessarily reshare it. So if A is the root node, then one measure we could have is the range of the cascade. And this could also be thought of as depth or the length of the chain. So how far in the network does something spread? We can also look at scale. So this would be how many unique users picked up a particular message. So if I share something, how many of my followers also shared it? And we can also look at speed, which in the traditional sense would be you know, time until adoption, a sort of hazard survival intuition. So we break it down into these three areas and we try to examine each of them independently with the idea that there might be some differential effects. So our first hypothesis is essentially a validation of the literature that there's a positive relationship between emotional strength and information share. And a lot of this comes from arguments around increased attention and increased arousal. So highly emotional content, positive or negative, will induce these sorts of physiological or cognitive reactions, which will then be expressed by sharing, sharing more. And it's not just that we share, but also that it gets picked up more in the network. And collectively, there's a broader diffusion and a faster diffusion. So I can summarize this, and I'm going a little fast because of time. Um, but the idea here is that greater sentiment, so just overall strength of sentiment, 
is positively associated with the range, scale, and speed of diffusion. So it's not just that one individual will pick it up and share it, but that in the entire network, it will disseminate more broadly. Um, for our second hypothesis, we argue for the curvilinear nature of this. Um, and we, we found a, a couple of different theories from a variety of different areas. One would be the spiral of silence, the idea that having um, unfavorable views or ideas can get you ostracized from a group. Uh, there's also the notion of context collapse, where this is a more unique feature of platforms where you're not able to selectively choose your audience. And as a result, you lose some of the nuance of interpersonal conversation or small group discussion. Um, of course, that might not be true if you're on something like Parler, which is tailored to certain people, but in general, you can experience this context collapse on media platforms. And then we also have the typical arguments around emotional suppression or uh, ambivalence and a hesitancy to share overly sensitive content. And so we argue that there's an inverse U-shaped relationship with all of our diffusion metrics, namely that the greatest diffusion will be with moderate emotional content, or that ex at extreme levels, we may see a tapering off of how viral something can go. All right, so with that, that sort of theoretical introduction, I'll talk about the methodology and data collection. Um, so we collected a series of tweets um, all centered around, uh, really it's the debate around vaccines, which is particularly salient now with the COVID-19 vaccine and particularly in the United States, uh, a large hesitancy to get it. Um, but we filtered using a variety of hashtags to filter out tweets that were about this vaccine movement over several months in 2019. Um, because it's a particular contentious issue, we have a wide range of sentiment strength. Um, people that are very pro, very against, and um, people use very emotionally charged language when discussing it. So it gives us a lot of variability and also something where there's potential for things to spread very rapidly. Um, to code things for sentiment and to get at this idea of emotion, we use the senti strength package to classify positive and negative emotions within text. So we did the text analysis and that rated everything on a basis of neutral to highly emotional, both on a positive and negative scale. So we could get a net polarity. And this might be, you know, your typical um, sentiment score, which would be, you know, a positive is a very happy message, negative is a very, you know, sad or angry message. Um, but we also calculated sentiment strength, so just overall aggregate sentiment by taking the absolute value of the positive and negative elements and combining them, subtracting by two just so that it's a zero to eight measure. Um, and this sentiment strength score will give us some idea of how emotionally charged positive or negative uh, message is. Uh, for our dependent variables, um, speed, pretty straightforward to calculate. We can use timestamps to figure out uh, time until the first spreading uh, or sharing of a message. Um, range, and that should say scale, is less, um, less straightforward. So we needed to convert the series of tweets from our data set into a diffusion cascade. And we used a, some established methods for doing this. I have that in my extra slides. I'm not gonna go over it too much. But basically you have to parse out um, particularly for range, whether someone retweeted the original tweet or they retweeted a retweet, if that makes sense. So parsing that out to try to figure out the range is a bit tricky, um, but we used some of these heuristics from the prior literature to do that. So we calculated all of our, uh, all of our measures this way. Um, other than that, we have some control variables. Uh, range and scale are count variables, so we use negative binomial regressions for the speed. Um, it's measured as time until first uptake, uh, so it's actually going to be on an inverse scale from the other ones, and we just used a linear regression for that. Okay, so real quick, not going to make you stare too hard at the tables, but basically we found significant effects. 
uh, for sentiment and sentiment squared, indicating inverse u shape relationship. If we plot that, we can see here for range, scale, and then speed, we have this curvature as one would expect, and this is the net value of sentiment. So we found that the longest cascades, um, those that are taken up by the most people, and those that had the least time until, uh, uh, until first sharing, all were with the moderate or moderately low level of sentiment. And again, that's positive plus negative, um, in absolute value. So it's not favoring one direction or the other. Um, we address this in some post hoc analyses, but valence or positive negative doesn't actually make too much of a difference, which we thought was interesting. But just net sentiment, a moderate value seems to be best. Um, and then we, we went into a variety of post hoc analyses. Um, not going to share all of them again because of time constraints. But one of the ones we thought was really interesting was the role of anonymity. And that when you have large collectives, particularly on social platforms like this, um, people don't have the same sort of blowback that they might get with interpersonal communication, right? I say something emotionally charged to someone in person, I'm gonna get a reaction immediately. Whereas on an online platform, I can hide behind an avatar, a screen name, uh, people don't necessarily know. And so we argue that the tension that we identify as countervailing forces are weakened when a larger proportion of the cascade itself is anonymous. And so what we mean by that is essentially the deleterious effect of having strong emotions is going to get weakened if most people are anonymous, right? Because there's no consequences for your action. Um, so we go into this process, we had a a lot of manual checking to try to determine what percentage of users were anonymous. Some combination of blue check marks, profile pictures, some other detection mechanisms. Um, but so we tried to do this. And essentially, I'll skip this and go to the slide or go to the image. Essentially, what we found, particularly for range, the range of a diffusion cascade, so the max degrees of separation from the root node was significantly higher when a larger proportion of the network was anonymous. Um, and these are, this should be sentiment strength squared, sorry. Um, but basically what we find is that if emotions are very strong, then if all of the users are anonymous, we really don't see any decline. We see the originally hypothesized linear relationship between emotion and diffusion that pretty much holds when everyone's anonymous. So essentially what we try, what we try to argue with this post hoc test is that the, that countervailing uh, force that we identified that tension is really only occurring when people are not anonymous. When people are anonymous and can hide behind, you know, the, the barrier of the platform, they're able to just share whatever they want. And yes, in general, emotional content will get spread farther. That's sort of the, the conclusion we try to argue from. Aaron, one minute to conclude. Yes. All right, perfect. I'm going to finish now. Um, yeah, I'll just say so. I'll, I'll skip to some limitations of future research. Um, obviously, the fact that we situated this in a debate around vaccines is going to color our results, uh, might not translate to other cases. Um, because we're using data on lots of metadata of tweets, we don't necessarily know exactly what's happening, any psychological mechanisms beyond what we can infer from theory. Um, and we're strongly considering following this up with some sort of experiment or even agent-based model to see if we can replicate these results or really push the boundaries farther. Uh, so yeah, for time and everything, I will stop there and take any questions. Thank you so much, Aaron. We have uh, three minutes for questions. Okay. Aaron, there's already a question in the chat. Can you, oh, can let you get me, to it? Let me stop sharing so I can look at the chat. Yeah, and then yeah, we can, can move on. Ah, okay, so that's a, that's a, good, a good question. Um, uh, Aaron, can you reiterate it for everybody? Yes, yes. Are you considering how different social media platforms temporal features may affect the relationship between emotional content and different aspects of information diffusion self-disclosure? thinking, especially in terms of persistent versus ephemeral, synchronous, asynchronous, et cetera. 
Yeah, so that's, um, that is a good point. So I think a lot of our findings are, you know, colored by the fact that we're using Twitter. And Twitter, once you put it out there, it's on people's feeds. Uh, it might disappear, but the tweet is always there. Whereas with Snapchat, you kind of have to see it in the moment or you have a shorter amount of time to react to it. So that's definitely a, I'd argue that that's a limitation of the work and something to explore further. Um, I'd be surprised if there wasn't an effect, but I, I, I can't really guess what that would be right now. But that's a very valid point. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, so the question is, degree the findings could be affected by cultural differences with regards to perceiving and sharing emotions. Uh, I absolutely think that that's true. I think there's a there's definitely something about the U.S., um, particularly about some of these vaccine issues. I mean, my opinion is kind of biased because of what's happening with us right now. Um, but in, in, in general, I think more emotionally expressive cultures may react differently than those that are typically more stoic or place a higher cultural value on you know keeping things to yourself and having the so-called stiff upper lip um I, I imagine that that would play a cultural role i think there'd also be a role of language differences so if you're looking at english language twitter um people with english is not their first language you know might not react the same way because they don't necessarily they may not perceive some of the underlying emotions depending on how they're expressed. So I think these sorts of cultural and language geographic things would um, would definitely play a role in modifying the results. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we're going to move on to Vahid, collective responsibility in multi-agent settings. Take it away, Rahid. Vahid. Sorry. Yeah. Mm. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. And we see Perfect. the slides as well. Yeah, great. So this is Vahid Baidiaz Dompana from University of Southampton. And this is going to be the last uh, talk in this Collective Intelligence 2021 on collective responsibility in multi-agent settings. Uh, it's actually a part of a line of research we are doing these days. It's a joint work with Enrico Gerding, Sebastian Stein, Corinna Criesta, MC Schreifel, Timothy Norman from Southampton and Nick Jennings from Imperial College London. I will try to uh, avoid uh, formal notions and technical notions. I don't have this kind of nice uh, experiments. It's more or less uh, formalization. And let me see if it goes forward. Yeah, it's a work supported by Autotrust, autotrust.org.uk, which is a research platform for early career researchers, mainly focusing on uh, different aspects of, let's say, uh, human-centered internet of vehicles. It's also supported by Trust for Autonomous Systems Hub, uh, TAS.ac.uk, uh, which is which itself is supported by UKRI, UK is body on research and innovation. The main idea in TAS Hub is um, to work on design, regulation, and operation of socially beneficial autonomous systems. So uh, first of all, like where this whole idea of collective responsibility, this line of research is positioned. It's between these like three uh, parts, let's say, multi-agent systems and distributed AI. If you're familiar with uh, this book by Mark Goldridge, uh, those AI researchers in uh, the community maybe know about uh, his work. Mark Goldridge, Nick Jennings, they all worked on this. And uh, it's like the main motivation of our work. We started from this. And the idea here um, is to ensure safety and reliability and trustworthiness of AI systems. Uh, mainly, we started thinking about autonomous vehicles. The other line uh, will be uh, moral philosophy and collective intentionality. If you're familiar with uh, philosophy of uh, Michael Bratman, this idea of shared agency, whether we can look at groups and see them uh, like uh, attribute sh uh, shared agency to groups or whether only individuals can be seen uh, with some level of autonomy or an agency. And basically here we are taking responsibility conditions in relation to different forms of collective ability from moral philosophy, how we can see some agent or a group of agents as being responsible. Uh, and this is mainly about groups influence on properties of the environment. 
So whether within their group or the environment they're interacting with. And then the last part that, that I will try to avoid in this call uh, is basically mathematical logic and formal methods. That's the methodology we actually use to formulate uh, responsibility. If you're familiar with line of work by Joe Halpern, uh, his recent book, Actual Causality, and uh, the other um, book, Reasoning About Knowledge by Fagin et al. I think it's Fagin, Vardy, and Halpern. Uh, so basically the idea here is to use mathematical logic, formal logic, modal logics actually to represent reason about and verify properties of uh, these collectives. So uh, I'm just going to talk about three uh, parts here. Uh, first of all, why we need new methods for reasoning about responsibility, uh, why it makes sense to talk about uh, collective responsibility. Uh, then four types of collective responsibility in multi-agent settings. And finally, a very brief um, slide uh, about our approach towards a formal framework to reason about responsibility. Uh, so uh, you heard this idea of autonomous vehicles. They're not yet on the road, but soon to come. Um, if we look at our like traditional understanding of responsibility, we are just dealing with autonomous agents to be humans. And then we have already some social structure, social notions of responsibility that work well. So if someone does something, then we see them responsible, probably liable, and then we have sanctions. So we have a structure in place that's working to some extent. But in case we have new forms of autonomy, so these autonomous vehicles that are making decision on their own, uh, to some level, ideally fully on, on their own. Uh, what happens in case we have an incident, we have a crash it's, or any form of undesirable situation, let's say, any state of affair that's undesirable. Uh, basically this uh, line of work on responsibility reasoning, we have two forms of responsibility, backward looking responsibility, formal, forward looking responsibility. Uh, forward looking is basically a form of task allocation. Uh, we are organizing a picnic, I say that I will be responsible for food, you will be responsible, you are responsible for driving. So it's a kind of uh, ascribing tasks. But the backward looking form, like uh, retrospective form of responsibility is more or less what we think about responsibility in the first place. Something happened, who is responsible for it? Who we can blame, who should pay for it? So this is like looking at something that's already materialized. And in this talk, I'm going to mainly focus on this uh, second form of responsibility, retrospective or post, uh, ex post responsibility. You can think of the Uber case. These are not just let's say, theoretical cases. Uh, it already happened. So we uh, had an Uber car, it crashed into someone. It was not fully autonomous. So the driver was still in the car, but with a kind of lower level of uh, control on the vehicle. So how we can attribute responsibility here? Is it like the driver? Is it Uber? Is it the manufacturer of the car? So how we can reason about responsibility in situations where the driver itself, so or the owner, uh, is not the only agent in this situation. We have other agents in place. Uh, if you think about this case, like going some steps back in history, like before that incident happened. So you see here this Uber car in front, that Tesla car over there, uh, the bicycle here. So these are some agents in the system. So that's why we are talking about collective responsibility here. Agent U, the, the Uber car, T for Tesla, B for bicycle. But there, is, there are also other agents here uh, with no physical action, but epistemic actions. This light communicates. So the point is here we have some physical actions, with some physical agents, but we also have some, let's say, epistemic uh, actions, or John Searle calls it institutional actions. So, and they, they have also influence here. And main question here would be like, if we look at the literature in moral philosophy, Ibo van der Poel from Delft University, uh, his paper on the relation between forward looking and backward looking responsibility, he lists uh, I think nine notions of responsibility here and how we can reason about responsible agents in such situ situations. Here, I'll just go through four notions of responsibility informally. 
uh, later on, I have, I think, one slide on formalization of one of them. Uh, the first form of responsibility here, we call it like responsibility or strategic responsibility. It's about those who could execute or avoid some actions. So in, in that sense, it's responsibility as causing or avoiding to cause. So mainly looking at their actions and, and what actions could they do or they could avoid. The other form is some agents could avoid and were knowledgeable about their power. So it's a kind of introducing this epistemic action, epistemic aspect here. It's blameworthiness as knowingly causing the situation. So this is like a distinction here, moving from, let's say, uh, plain responsibility to blameworthiness. Then the third uh, form would be these like uh, third and fourth, mainly the nature of the state of affairs itself is changing here. Uh, when we are talking about accountability, mainly we are talking about failing to deliver a task. So here, this uh, the nature of the state of affairs itself is changing. As we saw in the first two, it was just about the situation. But when someone fails, someone was able but fails to deliver a task, then we see them accountable. And then finally, sanctionability. If you look at the legal literature, you can call it liability. So this is like the highest form. In this case, you are blameworthy for causing a norm violation. It was either a kind of very soft norm, so it's a kind of in, in a society, some norm emerge, or a regulated norm. It was known that you should not hit that pedestrian, but you did it. So it's a kind of uh, four levels of responsibility, let's say. Uh, our idea here is if you're going to have more uh, autonomous agents in society other than humans, with more autonomy comes more and different forms of responsibility. If you want to keep it together in this circle, uh, in some form of controlled agency, controlled autonomy, we need different forms of responsibility. Uh, our approach to do this, like, as I said, if you look at the paper, you see some formalization there, some mathematical logic, I will avoid those, but just an idea uh, how we approach this problem. Uh, to capture these aspects, like capturing the strategic, temporal, epistemic, and normative aspects of uh, responsibility and these different forms of responsibility, we looked at uh, ATL logic, alternating time temporal logic. Uh, it allows reasoning about uh, these aspects, the strategic, temporal, and epistemic. And um, they have such uh, kind of, uh, let's say, modeling. I'm not going into details of uh, these couple that you see here, the double M, which includes a set of agents, some states, uh, some uh, propositions that hold in some states, and then uh, some relations that we call indistinguishability relation. If you look at these dashed lines, for instance, in the left side of this slide between Q0 and Q2, these two uh, states uh, are indistinguishable for agent blue. Let's say blue is one of those autonomous vehicles meaning that it cannot recognize whether uh, a vehicle is in Q0 or Q2. And you see, for instance, these kind of labelings, uh, green as safe state, red as uh, unsafe state. And uh, using these, we can like model the behavior of the system in, let's say, very uh, basic mathematical structure. And Rahid, then... uh, one or two minutes to come. OK. And then we have uh, formalization of responsibility, uh, then blameworthiness, accountability, and sanctionability can be built on top of uh, responsibility. And uh, we have like three conditions that the situation should uh, already happen. So we are not talking about unmaterialized situations. So five holes, then the collective has a had a strategy to avoid it uh, through the history and the group is minimal. Uh, our contribution here, if you look at the paper, we provide um, methods to formally verify if a collective is responsible. It has technical side and also legal side, and then uh, distinguishing these different forms of responsibility. Discussion points in case you want to talk now or maybe uh, in the panel uh, later. Uh, more specific notions of responsibility, for instance, uh, whether it makes sense to distinguish responsibility in a specific domains of application, whether we need full autonomy, or it makes sense to see these kinds of partial uh, graded notions of responsibility. And the idea that also Hila mentioned, this idea of flexible 
coordination or adaptive coordination. Uh, in such cases, it's not easy to distinguish something happened, who is responsible for it? Because through time, uh, like in some moments, one agent was in full control, but in some points in time, it was under control. So how we can reason about responsibility when the history of events through that history, uh, the autonomy is changing through time. Thank you. And hopefully you enjoyed the whole collective intelligence 2021. Thank you, Vahid. Um, um, uh, we have time for one question. So if there are no, no more questions, Rob, could you guide us through the end of the conference information? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Again, another really, really good session. So thank you. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you to all the speakers. We're gonna take 15 minutes and then we're gonna come back for the closing remarks. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll create some breakout rooms again, I think, for one last sort of informal mingling session, if you would like to do that. Um, otherwise, yeah, if there's anything you're wondering about, drop us a mail. Otherwise, yeah, we'll, we'll come back in 15 minutes and, and we'll bring it, bring it all together. Okay, thank you. <laughs>